Welcome to the podcast. We talk about all the things that are hidden in the shadows. This is Isaac. This is Megan. And on this episode, we dive back into the darkness. Yeah, this one, this one was actually my idea to do. I normally am like meh, not not meh, but like just I don't know. I kind of like to cover other subjects other than demonic possessions, but this one in particular. Because, you know, like, when you hear about demonic possessions, I feel like, like, the UK gets talked about a lot with their kind of stuff. Obviously, in America, we have some. But, like, you don't really hear... And that's one of the goals I have for 2024 is to cover more of areas that don't get talked about with possession cases or with haunted locations in general. Because we always kind of think, oh, in America, we got these big bad locations. But all over the world, there are some insane stuff that happens paranormal wise and so I had just been looking up different stories and unsolved mysteries and stuff like that and this had came up because I had been told stories my grandmother has a friend that's from the Philippines and uh, she was telling me yeah like paranormal stuff is it's taboo a little bit over there but there's like a lot of crazy stuff like in witchcraft and all that stuff that happens over there and um I just so happened to stumble upon this one as well. And I was like, oh, wow, it's the Philippines in the 1950s. So. Yeah. This is all about the position. Of Clarita Villanueva. Villanueva. Yeah. Yes. Uh, interesting fact to those who don't know. Um, Philippines, the Filipinos and the rest of the Latino race all share the uh, same Continuity, I guess, as we describe it. They're half Spaniard, like the rest of us, because Spaniards conquered the Philippines as they did Mexico and majority of the South American uh, countries. That's why we all speak Spanish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what uh, her, the, the lady that my grandmother is friends with, her name is Adele. And uh, she talks about that all the time. She says even like there there's certain foods that they have that are similar. And then there's certain words that they have that are similar to Spanish as well. Yeah. Just so uh, everybody... Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, well, a little fact for you. Yeah. But we don't, we're talking about a possession case because this one kind of gets, not say swept underneath the rug, but when it comes to famous possession cases, it's not on top of the list. Uh, but it did gain it's just as much publicity as any other out there for its time. Yes. Now, Clarita had a very tragic beginnings of her life. Um, at a young age... Uh, her father was never around or died. Never really gave a specification mm-hmm. of what happened to her dad. But her mom was either a psychic medium by trade or she was a real psychic medium. However, however uh, her Clarita always says that she always uh, witnessed her mother laughing at uh, customers after they would leave and making fun of them as they uh, weren't, weren't there anymore. Mm-hmm. Which kind of hinted at the fact that she might have been a charlatan. Like she perceived herself as a uh, psychic medium doing uh, seances and uh, crystal ball stuff. Um, but she, uh, her mother passed away when she was only 12. And with no family and no uh, immediate people to take care of her, she basically was thrown to the streets. And this is the 1950s, mind you. Yeah. And the Philippines. So she resorted to prostitution in order to survive. And then around the age of 18... She went looking for her father. See, I didn't read that part. See, that's where... There's a lot of information. Yeah, there's... Because he... Because how Isaac researches is he listens mainly to podcasts. Other podcasts. Don't tell people how the sausage is made. (laughs) And I and I tend to go to like the documentaries and like the I read things, I look at other podcasts, I listen to other things, stuff Mm -hmm. like that. I get different people's perspectives to understand the entire story. Yes. But I will say different articles they have around about the same overall story. But it just varies in different things. Like there's probably some articles that say Clarita's father died. But um in the articles that I read, when she was 18, she went looking for him. And then there's another article that says basically she, which is the article or story you're telling, which is... Well, when she she had a boyfriend, she moved to, uh, what was the city she moved to? Manila. Manila. Um, but she found out her boyfriend has uh, had a wife. 
So she was kind of like, oh, crap. And then, like, I can't be with you anymore. So she was like, what the hell am I supposed to do now? Mm-hmm. So she did what she did. She knew. She became an exotic dancer for uh, a couple of years. Yes. Yeah. And then she basically, you know, like, did that kind of stuff to survive. And she made the mistake of, so, like, soliciting herself to... She thought it was just a random guy, but it was like a police officer. And so then she got put in jail. And that's where this story kind of takes a wrong turn. Yes. And when it comes to possession cases, hers was, and I say unique, but it dang, it did dang, it did gain, say combined words in my head, <laughs> it gained a lot of publicity for its time. Um, newspapers around the world and stuff like that, they knew about her. Uh, or at least knew about the case that was happening. But what was the uh, the prison that she went to? Uh, if you ever go to the Philippines, uh, I definitely want to try to investigate that location. Yeah, the prison itself is like 300 years old. It's like the Byzantine. Yeah, and then... Um, Byzantine prison. It's uh, 300 years old, built by the Spaniards. Used for torturous things back then in the Spanish Inquisitions. And then the Americans and the Filipinos used it as well. And didn't really treat people that well inside. Yeah. So you could just imagine before she probably even, like, staying there, there was, um, I know some articles talked about, like, her and other cellmates that were female were hearing, like, activity, basically. Pebbles being thrown, uh, weird stuff kind of happening. So there was some sort of paranormal activity that took place before she actually got possessed. I don't know. It was oh, possessed. I think it was oppressed. Oppressed. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. It was. I guess. Okay. I guess you could say it was more oppressed than possessed. But the part that, well, here, go on with the story because I don't <laughs> want to jump ahead. Uh, while in the prison, she started receiving uh, bite marks all over her body. Granted, there was no one else in her cell, and she started screaming and crying out. And doctors, uh, the, the I'm sorry, the guards went to see what was going wrong to see her that she was all these bite marks and she was bleeding from these bite marks on her body and he had no idea where they're coming from uh so the doctors started examining her and they said they, they couldn't figure out why she was being received uh that way but while in i guess it was the uh how do you call it the uh, prison hospital I forgot what, what is the prison i hospital? forgot what it's what called. It called yeah i don't know what it's called uh, you've never been in jail before so we <laughs> 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 try to remember the damn name of it hold on the prison infirmary informatory I think so, I think so. Yeah. I don't know. Regardless, the, the built in the prison hospital. Yes. Um, she was examined for a while, and then to kind of find out, she described what was attacking her was uh, two uh, creatures. One, a monstrous in the size, she called a monster. Uh, how she described it is... And the thing, yeah. Sure. It's something, something smaller, like a goblin kind of thing. Which always goes to my theory, or not my theory, what I've come to uh, find out is that demons always come in three. There's always three of them. There's one in charge and there's two minions. But she only ever saw two. Uh, she described the big one as uh, the skin was black and it was hairy, uh, had horns, um, had sharp fang teeth, and, well, two sharp fang teeth that came down past his jaw, and then the rest where she described as buck teeth surrounding the entire area around the mouth. Uh, same goes for the smaller creature, too, which described the how she described it was exactly how the bite marks looked all over her body. So she mm-hmm. was matching them up exactly. But the smaller one, she described as a goblin, would crawl on her back and bite her on her, uh, f- I guess, the softer parts of her flesh, like her back and the back of her legs and stuff like that. And that's how they knew these weren't self-inflicted because mm-hmm. there were parts of her body that she could never, ever even try to attempt to bite. So that kind of got ruled out real quick. So they thought maybe someone was attacking her. That's why they kept her in the informatory for a while. But she still received them. And they even witnessed the marks appearing on her body out of nowhere, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. Yeah, like there was some articles that even just said that moistness around the bite marks, like someone had just done it. And one of the things, too, that they were talking about is the fact she would lose consciousness, right? She would like black out every now and then and then lose consciousness. And I always go back to, um, there was one person that we knew that had been, had to get exercised. And I remember... A long time ago, I had shown her because I had like this random like vision of this place, and I sh- I remember showing her, 
And she goes, oh, that kind of looks like when I would lose consciousness. And I was like, what are you talking about? She goes, well, you know, like when you dream, right? When you dream and you go into like the astral plane, the realm, whatever you want to say, like dream world. She goes, that's exactly how it was. It was like when I would lose consciousness according to other people. I didn't know I was losing cautious consciousness. I thought I was asleep. I was awake one minute and then asleep. Like I had dozed off and, but other people had said, no, I had blacked out and I was still awake, but I was essentially, I had black solid black eyes and I was doing things that obviously weren't myself. So she was saying, yeah, like when basically whatever the thing that was demonically attached to her came through, um, and basically had control over her vessel. It was like she was in lost consciousness and was in dream world, apparently. Um, but she says it's not a dream world like the nice side of the astral plane. She says it's like burnt ash and lava and like smells bad, like foul, like sulfur there. And she said she would just literally sit there. And then she would come to and she would wake up and she was like, oh, I was, and I had this weird dream and this and that. And they were like, no. You had solid black eyes and you were doing very strange shit. <laughs> so I think that's interesting that she also, that that was also said that she had lost consciousness. Yeah. Now this caught the attention of local news and stuff like that. A reporter who came, witnessed his stuff, and he started uh, sharing his story and articles and stuff like that, especially with the radio uh, of the time telling this. And the news started spreading across the entire world. Even reports in the United States at the time were like uh, the possession of Clarita going on in the Philippines. Granted, how many people actually believed it, who knows. But one of the doctors actually accused Clarita of doing making this all up. Like, you're just doing it for publicity. You might as well get famous for it. And she looked at him, and it was described that she looked at him with like pure hatred and said, You die. Right. Uh, I was scared of shit, everyone who was listening to right now. (laughs) (laughs) Fun fact, Isaac used to be a metal vocalist. Yes. Uh, And the scary part is that he literally died the next day. And then everyone started accusing her of being a witch, putting curses on people, which in the Philippines, that would make sense. In the 50s, they would say that she just, it's a coincidence, but they're a little more superstitious in the Philippines. So, yeah, they accused her of being a witch amongst the other travesties that she was being uh, accused for as well. It was actually uh, a little bit later uh, after witnessing these things that a uh, sorry a prison guard actually kicked her and it was like hitting her because she wasn't uh, complying with something after they put her back in her cell and she looked at him and said again and he ended up dying a week later so mm-hmm. two two guards die and stuff like that and they didn't know what to do uh, some of the, uh, one of the doctors the doctor said we need to get an exorc- exorcism done right. They're like, we're medical professionals. We're not going to do that, right? He says, well, we got no other choices. We can't figure out what's wrong with her. So a reverend, what was the reverend? Uh, Lester Sumar- Su- Sumrall. Uh, he was building, uh, he was helping build basically like a temple area. He was doing work in the Philippines. Yeah. So he was a foreigner yeah. for the time. Yeah. Got word of it and or they asked him, since he was only reverend in the area, he could perform the exorcism. They asked him. And they actually, he had to um, not sign a waiver, but they basically told him, like, dude, she's killed two people. Uh, she's injured a lot, of, a lot a lot of other guards and stuff like that. We can't be liable for anything that happens to you. He was like, it's fine. It's fine. So he goes in. They actually take her to a, a separate room where she didn't react to the guards or the doctors whatsoever. It was fine. But the second she saw the reverend, she fucking started screaming and growling at him, right? Mm-hmm. And he basically said, I hate you, right? Yeah. And probably a voice that sounds similar to mine to the girls. Yeah. So, but she's basically yelling at him, I hate you, and stuff like that, and throwing a fit, and uh, realized, okay, this is, this is, we're dealing with something strong here. But uh, they ended up performing the exorcism, and it took three days, right? And after the three days, all of a sudden she was fine. She was smiling. She said they left. Actually, they left out the window by her words. And her bite marks disappeared. Granted, she was still incarcerated. Mm -hmm. But her possession was done. Yeah. And she ended up having a 
pretty regular life. She ended up getting out, marrying a guy, and having a family and everything else, and everything was good. So, yeah. Now, let's dissect this. Dissection. (laughs) The story of Clarita is very short, right? Mm -hmm. From how it started, how it ended, all the facts in between. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a lot of information of witnesses or anything like that. A lot of the information was shared. Granted, it's the 50s in the Philippines, so I don't know how much information you're going to get. I think it's interesting they didn't try to... Because you think about in the 50s, and I'm sure if it was in America, it was probably everywhere as well. You know, the whole, like, if if anything is wrong with you in the asylum, like, throwing you, locking you away in, like, a crazy house. I mean, wonder and if I, this prison had its own asylum and I, But that's what I didn't, like, I'm, there were psychiatrists that tried evaluating her and tried, tried getting something, but they were even stunned at the fact of the bite marks just showing up. So I just find it interesting that it was, like, in the 50s, and it was, like, for sure, people were like, there is something possession something with this woman well luckily the doctors were not so narrow-minded with the idea of science and practice uh, science and medicine that they decided to reach out to another form of healing which was an exorcism mm-hmm. right in america i guarantee at the time they might have not even even attempted it even with all the signs as to where shit going on Mm -hmm. and i think that's another thing that we didn't mention at the beginning but she only spoke to galen which is what they speak in the philippines that's the name of their language she only spoke that but when she was possessed she also was able to speak english and latin in several languages yeah Yeah. and that's one of the telltale signs when you speak a language you don't you have never learned Uh, and i i wonder if because it was such a short, like, almost oppression, if, because, you know, you hear stories and it's, like, months and a long time of, like, basically um, everything kind of, like, wearing you down. Even for people that are just, like, low vibrational, it still takes a while. So, they didn't really say, like, I think, well, no, they did. I remember looking, and the days were relatively close that all of this happened, and I just find it interesting that it took so little like time for her to be oppressed. I mean, she did come from a bad background, and so I mean that's what I theorize and why she was chosen. Um, if her mother was a real psychic, then she had it carried in her bloodline, mm-hmm. making Carlita a possible psychic medium as well. If she was a charlatan, probably not. Mm-hmm. But she still had a very tragic life, uh, a lot, of, lot of trauma she's carried. Right, easy to be broken and beaten. And especially mm-hmm. in a state of being bitten, right? Mm-hmm. Like these demons like to bite, uh, which is strange because I've never heard of any other bite. I guarantee there is other bite cases, but not in this extent. Like it was all over her body. Like they, mm-hmm. the demons enjoyed doing that to her. And it was her anguish and her her uh, her pain is what fueled their, their I guess, their addiction. Because I've always said that demons are, when what they want from you more than anything is your negative emotions. Mm-hmm. Your sadness, your anger, your trauma, everything negative emotion-wise. It's like a drug to them. They get extremely high off it. They feed on it. And the more and more you give them, the more and more they stay. And the ultimate thing is to fully possess you and basically drain you from the inside out, taking control and then causing t- t- uh, turmoil within the entire house. And then, oh, God, they're feeding off everybody. Mm-hmm. Everybody's giving them something. Mm-hmm. And then when they're when it's all said and done and the vessel dies, you move on to another. Uh, but that was the case with her. And I think that's where she, that those things, that demon was in that prison, probably picking and choosing, feeding off all the negative emotion. And they finally found someone like, Ooh, I can attach to this one. And that's what he did. Attached to them and basically mildly possessed her. Which I tried looking at cause I, I really wanted to compare and see if there was anything regarding like jails and possessions. If there was more, possession cases out there that evolved from jails there really wasn't and i find that interesting like i would think that it would be more because you know some of the people in there are as low vibrational as you can go sorry for the interruption i had to swap batteries because our our recorder thing was drained yes so i don't know what that long story short we've been having some weird stuff today to just today in general it's not anything bad Obviously, we're protected and stuff like that, but it's... So, there's EVPs in this episode. Uh, listen for them? Yeah. Right. Who knows? Maybe. 
Um, something's been trying to get my attention all day. Uh, what were you saying? Oh, yeah. So you would think that like jails would have it because they're har- harbingers of negative negative stuff. Like you've got people that have killed people. You've got people that probably have dark attachments themselves in there. Um, just the amount of brutality that happens in, in prisons, you know? Like I said, it takes the right kind of mind, the right kind of person to be oppressed. Uh, it has to be someone who's willing to give up their will. The willpower. Yeah, and when you think about it, maybe some of those criminals aren't no. willing to give up their willpower. Now, they're scared, they're angry, right? Some are depressed, but none are willing to give up the will. Uh, not in the beginning, anyway. Yeah. And probably over time, they are. But there has to be some reason why they had to choose as prisons. Not, any, not these times anymore. Yeah. Or maybe there is a lot of inmates getting possessed, and I don't even know it. True. Yeah. Yeah, because, like, I looked, I, that was the... Sp- one like spot that I I specifically like wanted to look into because I was like that would be an interesting topic about like demonic possessions or oppressive oppressions demo- or not demonic necessarily but like negative attachments as well to see if like there's a correlation you know to jails and prisons and that why that would also make sense if. Like, why a lot of jails are haunted. Like, for instance, like, the Eastern State Penitentiary. I mean. Also, it's good to like people dying in a location. Yes. Yeah. But with Cleara's case, that's why I believe she was <clears throat> chosen to be a possessed, uh, was the fact that she has a, uh, a broken soul, you could say. Theorizing also the idea that, that it was already there. Now, was it an oppression case or was it a possession case? I think I think it was oppression. I think it was still outside of her body. Uh, meh, maybe but then how the did she speak lose, with that? That is true. And lose consciousness. Yeah. So I'm thinking she was possessed. Mm-hmm. But it was very mild. Or is just starting. It just started, yeah. Yeah. Because the bite marks were continuing as she was possessed. As these things were like marking her territory. I just find it interesting. So in that prison as dark as it is it was only those two things that doesn't make sense to me what's the thing given three there might have been one of it missing maybe that the other one that was missing was the one that was doing the killing mm, right because she higher... cursed apparently two people and they both died was it by coincidence i don't know uh i can't really say that but the fact that they died after her saying that either she predicted it was going to happen and she chose those two people but both those two people were um People that tried helping. No, 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 not helping. But the doctor said you're making the shit up. Oh, and the and the guard was basically kicked her. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't know why I said trying to help. Malicious. That's the word. Yeah, they were malicious to her. Mm -hmm. And she said you're gonna die, and she did. And you think about all of the different paranormal situations that that's occurred with Robert the doll. Mm -hmm. That's occurred with um, Annabelle. Annabelle. A lot of those. So that's, again, it's, and you got to think, too, this was the 50s. None of the major cases had been out yet. Like the, the Annabelle doll, right? Yeah. None of that was out yet. That was 70s, wasn't it? Annabelle Horror, 70s. Uh, Conjuring House, 70s, 80s. Yes, yeah. yeah. No, I think it was 70s. 70s? I think late 70s. Yeah. Um, people were like, you don't know the dates. You'll keep them memorized. To be honest, quite frank, my brain has been so fried because I'm in training. For this, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so uh, yeah, I mean, and you think too, like, because I asked, I asked my grandmother's friend, I was like, because like she was born and raised in the Philippines. I asked her, I was like, um, because I asked her about like witchcraft and dark dark magic over there like what that and she goes oh yeah it's definitely done um a lot of the paranormal stuff like it she's like it, it kind of depends like like they tell you oh don't talk about it but then at the same time they also tell you oh it very much exists so and she has a lot of paranormal stuff that happens to her too she- there it goes test one test two test three test four so now it's working okay for anyone listening, we just had this <laughs> damn thing we record on, say data full, 
right? Which we didn't fill it up. Battery died again. And then it said kept doing this corrupted like uh, data write error thing, which you've never seen before. Uh, and now the battery's almost dead again. And it wasn't until I like pushed protection energy that we were able to record. So listen, I don't know. <laughs> I'm kind of excited to edit this one because yeah, something is really trying. Right, we've had things in the episode. We have episodes in the past that have pe- things have tried to stop it from getting out but this one seemed very adamant about not yeah, getting out. Yeah, this is probably the worst. So uh, before we go any longer than we need to um, I think uh, one of my final things to say about this case is what we would have done in such a situation. Mm-hmm. Right? For anyone listening to this episode and stuff like that first episode you ever listened to from us uh, I would say go listen back to Shadow Walker episodes 1 through 6 so I'm going to explain my ability again. And then listen to Megan's... Well, Shadow Walker Part 5 and 6 kind of explain about Megan's abilities as well. Mm-hmm. But what we would have done would have been very simple. and wouldn't have taken three days. wouldn't have taken one day. wouldn't even take three hours. It would have taken 30 minutes. That's my record standing for taking something like that out of a location. Now, a possession case? I have no idea. That is always said my big final test is to pull a demon out of someone or at least see if I can and that's the part where somebody listening right now goes what the fuck did you just say <laughs> yeah. I have gone on record claiming whether anyone mm-hmm. listening right now believes it or not but I have mm-hmm. done it and I have receipts for doing it taking dark entities from locations and imprisoning them in an object not just any object a King Solomon replica ring I have been doing this for the last two and a half years and been successful with it like I said I have receipts. I would say go listen to Dal's story and listen to Mike and Christie's story. Uh, Mike from Mike and Christie from Unknown Paranormal, and listen to them explain it from their side of how they described how the situation was before and how the situation was after. Mm-hmm. But I would say the possession case is our final case because we've done a good amount of oppression cases, a good amount of them already. I think eighteen, nineteen, and we're up to now, and all successful. And uh, it takes, sometimes it takes one to two tries, but after that, usually no. Sometimes we miss something the first time around. Because I feel like a lot of the times, the most dangerous thing is up front, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because that's even with me, like when I, when we, when I remove you into the case or whatever, like into the location, um, to be able to explain what's there to, because we work a lot with Mike from and Christy from Unknown Paranormal on these cases, and so I essentially go and I kind of like peek around, remote viewing, kind of uh, figuring out what's at a location or what's at someone's house, and for me, it always shows what the most dangerous thing is up front, like the first thing I see, and then. Then after Isaac clears it, then I start seeing like other little pieces and stuff like that. But like for me, it's always what is causing the most harm right now and what needs to go, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so in a situation like this, they would uh, <laughs> uh, call me to the prison. Uh, I would stand in front of Clarita. Granted, I wasn't born in the 50s, so this would be way yeah. before my time. But let's say a situation happened today. Um, grab hold of a demon. At least our theory is anyway of... Mm-hmm. with a possession case and pull it from the object which is the person out of take it in prison along with its minion or anything else would be in that prison mm-hmm. as well and i think for you know we normally do like oppression stuff remotely mm-hmm. or not like oppression attachments like that kind of yeah. stuff remotely but i think for a possession case for sure at least the first one would have to be in front of the person yes because it's housing that vessel versus just being like attached, if that makes sense. This is a whole new territory. Yeah, it's something we never encountered before. And but, it's more of a like a, a more of a um, attachment to the person versus like if there's like something in the house or something like that kind of thing. But as I always say, not to sound egotistical or cocky, just a matter of fact, I have yet to have something stop me. When I start to pull. So I doubt there will ever be something to stop me. He has had difficult stuff. but Difficult, but not impossible. Yeah. So 
Yeah, with that being said, I thought that was interesting because, you know, with a lot of the other possession cases, you know, there's like grounds for saying it's like a hoax and stuff like that. Almost every possession case, I think that they talk about, there's the other side to it, which says it's a hoax. It's it's more of a mental issue. But even with her, there was, there was hardly any of those claims because like you said, they couldn't explain the bite marks on on the the back back. and they literally the i forgot if it was a doctor or the guard or somebody but somebody that worked and was like monitoring her went in and actually saw it form yeah on her like it wasn't like oh these were you know she could have done it bit herself on her arms and stuff like that it actually showed up in front of her in front of them yeah and so I think that's interesting and I think it's one of those things that the demonic thing was like you know what I'm gonna do this because it's terrifying to know something can bite you and you can't even see it you know it's like feeding on the fear of the doctors and everybody else there in the prison as well yeah kind of heightening everything up yeah exactly from one of our previous cases that seems to be the, the MO yeah yeah um but I think that wraps us up today before the batteries die again. Yeah. Well, put it to you this way. My <laughs> phone was at 40% and I haven't had issues with my phone unless we were at investigations. But it went from 40% till right when I the battery on the thing was dying, I got a notification. Your battery is less than 10%. Random, and these are cheap. Ass yeah, Dollar these General are, batteries. <laughs> yeah. Dollar Tree. Not even Dollar yeah. General. Dollar Tree batteries but still um i don't know dollar tree batteries i've put in those little well i don't know this is not a flashlight (laughs) yeah that's true but so what are we talking about next week so next week you forgot already i forgot already told you my brain is at max capacity the glimmer man oh yeah the glimmer man or the shimmer man yeah they, they it's been called two two things but basically i think we talked about it in the bigfoot episode and i've talked about it on social media but the the legend that isaac talked about about the 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 shimmer slash glimmer man that looks like the predator basically yeah because i also saw a uh video i think it was on vine before tiktok mm-hmm. um of a guy who was in the woods and had a camera and he saw something like that and then he heard a growl, and then all of a sudden you see the camera like drop to the ground, and the guy starts screaming as you hear like something being cut him apart. Oh my gosh! Whether it was real or not, well, I no, don't know. I I went down a rabbit hole after the Bigfoot episode, and I went down and started looking because I wanted to make a post about it on our social media, and I read some encounter stories, and I'm like, what the heck? Because yes. they basically yeah described it as like a heat wave coming off a tree. Yeah, it's like very predator esque. Yes. Um, but yeah, look forward to that next week. Um, also, fun fact: if anyone listening, I was on a podcast recently. Uh, I was on IV, I E V P'd my pants <laughs> podcast uh, with Mike G. Yeah, uh, and his uh, his uh, his crew of uh, mus- muskrits. Yeah. muskrits. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was fun. They uh, they bring a little comedy to their their episodes, and we talked about residual energy and stuff like that, and uh, hauntings and uh, other things surrounding the paranormal. Uh, they kind of asked me questions on stuff that I do and some theories that I might have. But yeah, it was a good episode. Yeah, so go check out uh, IVP'd IVP'd my pants uh, podcast. Yeah, uh, it was really good. You listen to it, you find it anywhere you find podcasts. Yeah. Um. So as for us. You can catch our socials at um, Hidden in the Shadows Podcast on Instagram, Hidden in the Shaw 6 on X, Hidden in the Shadows Pod 2 on TikTok, or links to all social media and always listen to us at Hidden Shadows Podcast.com. And if you're dealing with any kind of uh, cases or dealing with things in your home and need help, uh, easily reach out to us through Hidden in the Shadows Podcast on Instagram or Hidden in the Shadows Paranormal on Instagram as well. Messages through there, email us through the website, however you feel they can contact with us. But no case too small, no case too big that we can't handle. Yes. But as always, we'll catch your weirdos in the next one. Yeah.